we often ask uh, to compare Russian situation with uh, situation in Soviet Union at Stalin times and with situation in, jo in Germany in Hitler times. Uh, I can say that I'm not in favor of such comparisons. Uh, they always seem a little bit artificial to me. Of course, it looks interesting, it looks fascinating to start comparing. But um, countries, uh, times, uh, people, everything is really different. And the, such comparisons can be used to my mind as well, only as something like mind games, nothing more. You can see some. Uh, common features, and that's all. Uh, anyway, it's clear that uh, current regime in Russia is, I hope, it is uh, softer than in Stalin times, and uh, I'm sure it is. It is not as um, terrible as it used to be in Germany in the 30s. So far, at least. But at the same time. Uh, every historian can try to uh, to assess, to analyze situation in any country and try to describe it in some terms. So uh, to me it is clear that Russian political regime, Russia at the moment, can be, unfortunately, can be described as fascist country. And uh, Maybe, I suppose, many of you remember 14 uh, uh, features of fascism described, uh, formulated by a great Italian linguist and philosopher, Umberto Eco. Uh, we often think now about these things. And if we look at them, so we, we, unfortunately we can see that almost all of them, or maybe even all of them, are present in today's Russia. And it is, we should understand that fascism is not always Nazi Germany, it's not always Auschwitz, but it has a lot of unpleasant features. Let's have a look at what Umberto Ecker writes. First of all, the cult of tradition one has only to look at the syllabus of every fascist movement to find the major traditionalist thinkers. The Nazi Gnosis was nourished by traditionalist syncretistic, syncretistic occult elements. The cult of tradition is surely present in Russia. Not only today, but it was like that five, ten years ago. Uh, well, theoretically, cult of tradition is always present. but. Uh, last two, one or two decades it has been uh, it has become stronger and stronger and uh, tradition is uh, understood as very aggressive and I'd say fundamentalistic understanding of Christianity and of uh, old Russian traditions in uh, everyday life which means a very traditional family life. Uh, permission, moral and even judicial permission of domestic violence and all that kind of things. At the same time, uh, it's clear that a Russian state today more and more thinks, understands itself as uh, uh, as a continuation of a Russian state before revolution. And uh, we can find a lot of good things in Russia before 1917. But today's Russia takes mostly things that, to my mind, led Russia to revolution 100, and 100, and years, 100 years ago. So again, such as Christianity, a uh, rigid situation, uh, wish to stop any reforms, and so on. And so the cult of tradition is today's part of today's Russia. 
Second, the rejection of modernism. The Enlightenment, the age of reason, is seen as the beginning of modern depravity. In this sense, fascism can be defined as irrationalism. It's also clearly here, and we can say that age of enlightenment is something that is strongly connected with modern European development. Uh, life of European countries, of most European countries today, is based on ideas of French Revolution, of uh, liberty, liberté, uh, fraternité, égalité, of um, ideas formulated at the end of 18th century and uh, ideas that has been develop, developing all this time. Uh, at the moment, Russia is, re is rejecting most things that come from the West and especially everything connected with human rights, which is also part of enlightenment. And by the way, uh, I, old, old, old idea that uh, West is too rational, too cold, too intellectual, while Russia is uh, Russia is so Russia is emotion, which means Russia is irrational. That is something that is always present. Number three, the cult of action for action's sake. Action being beautiful in itself, it must be taken before or without any previous reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation. Um, maybe it's not as clear as, for example, in Germany in the 30s or in Italy in Mussolini time, but Mr. Putin himself is image of such action. He, uh, at least he tried before the war, at the moment we See, we can see him very rarely, but before the war, before the COVID, uh, he always presented himself as a very strong person, a uh, person, a uh, very physically strong person, somebody who, who can ride a horse, who, who can uh, fly a paraplane, who can swim, uh, who can fight, and so on. It is a very important image of somebody uh, a cool, macho man um, who never thinks too much. It's kind of example for Russian people. At least it must be. Number four, disagreement is treason. The critical spirit makes distinctions, and to distinguish, and to distinguish is a sign of modernism. In modern culture, the scientific community praises disagreement as a way as a way to improve knowledge. And in Russia, of course, this agreement is treason. I can remind you of dozens or maybe hundreds already of Russian people who tried to show their disagreement. First of all, of Alexei Navalny, one of the most important of opposition leaders in Russia, who is now in jail and who gets new verdicts. And it's clear that idea of authorities, Putin's idea is to keep him in jail as long as possible. But other people who are not as famous as Navalny is, they are also put in jail just because disagreeing, just because they have said that peace is better than war, or some people even that because they uh, went uh, to some public to a public place with clean piece of paper where nothing was written, even this, uh, even such um, thing is understood as disagreement, as dangerous disagreement. Uh, number five, fear of difference. The first appeal of a fascist or prematurely fascist movement is an appeal against the intruders. Thus, all fascism is racist by definition. It's clear that Russia is a really racist country. And this racism is supported and promoted by states. We have awful, disgusting examples of um, racist attitudes towards migrants from uh, Central Asia and towards uh, uh, non-white people. And at the moment, which seems really absurd, uh, there is kind of racism against Ukrainian people who, who are presented all of them are presented as uh, Nazi, as 
dangerous enemies. Number six, appeal to social frustration. One of the most typical features of historical fascism was the appeal to a frustrated middle class, a class suffering from an economic crisis or feelings of political humiliation and frightened by the pressure of lower social groups. I'm not sure that uh, Russian regime aims exactly at Russian middle class, simply because middle class is really weak in Russia. But of course, Putin, from the beginning of his rule, he has played with this feeling of social frustration that millions of Russian people unfortunately felt in the 90s after the collapse of, after collapse of Soviet Union, when they felt um, humiliated by, uh, grew, uh, by uh, bad economic situation, which left many people uh, who used to feel them, themselves quite well in Soviet time, at least um, quite uh, normal uh, in Soviet times, then uh, lost their positions, lost their jobs, lost their uh, self-respect, and also lost their big Soviet empire. They felt very much um, associated with. And so Putin, when he started promoting imperial feelings uh, with crime, aggression, uh, annexation of Crimea in 2014, strangely and sadly, it gave many people feeling of national pride. Just because of this social frustration, they felt they had felt before that. Number seven, the obsession with the plot. Thus, at the root of the fascist psychology, there is the obsession with the plot possibly an international one. The followers must feel besieged. This is a favorite idea now that a lot of, a lot of different forces are plotting against Russia. American imperialists, of course, who wants to overthrow Russian regime and make Russia weak, as if Russia is not weak by itself. Now Europeans are also considered to be enemies European Union is plotting against Russia. They do not want to, get, to have our gas and oil and so on. Ukrainians are part of this plot. And Russian opposition is seen as people connected with these uh, terrible enemies. Uh, the eighth, the enemy is both strong and weak. By a continuous shifting of rhetorical focus, the enemies are at the same time too strong and too weak. It is clearly seen if we look at the image of the United States in Russian propaganda at the moment. Uh, at the one hand, uh, people are, con are constantly said that Russians, uh, that the US is, um, is plotting, is trying to destroy Russia, trying to uh, uh, bring a, a lot of bad things from McDonald's to uh, corrupt morals to Russia. And this image, this image shows the USA as very strong, terrible enemy. At the same time, uh, often we can see how propaganda presents the USA as a weak country. Uh, Political people who think themselves political experts explain that the USA will soon fail, that uh, the American economy is weak, American political situation is too turbulent, and the USA, at the one hand, is a terrible enemy, at the one, and the other hand, it is quickly going to its fall. Uh, number nine, pacifism is trafficking with the enemy. Uh, for fascism, there is no struggle for life, but rather life is lived for struggle. That's something that is happening, unfortunately, at the moment in Russia. When uh, you can't, cannot even call things happening in Ukraine war. There is a very strange uh, um, phrase, uh, description of this situation, special operation. So it is not war cannot fight against war because Russia is not in war with anybody. Russia is presented 
as peaceful country, but at the same time as a country uh, moving its armies forward because it fights for the right reason, you can't fight against it. Fight, you can't fight against it. If you do, you are an enemy. You are even, even worse, you are a traitor. Number 10, contempt for the weak. Elitism is a typical aspect of any reactionary ideology. Weak people, uh, weakness of any kind, is considered to be something shameful in Russia. You should think of uh, thousands and thousands of disabled people who, do, um, who get uh, very small help from the state and which is maybe even worse, um, disabled people. Uh, children with um, physical or mental problems are continuously uh, laughed at and uh, sometimes persecuted in schools and uh, left in isolation, uh, as well as elderly people, as well as uh, well anybody who is not a real strong man who can beat, just physically beat anybody you are nobody, or almost nobody. Uh, and 11, everybody is educated to become a hero. In old fascist ideology, heroism is the norm. This cult of heroism is strictly linked with the cult of death. Well, it, uh, it was very strong in Stalin times when suicidal actions during the war were presented as kind of model for everybody. Everybody should be ready to die for its, his or her motherland. And now, when this unnamed war is going on, people are also supposed to fight for it. And at least, I mean, uh, there are people who say it. We can't judge what they feel or think, but they say that they are ready to die, they are ready to give their children uh, to this state that is fighting, just because being a hero is better than being alive. Uh, Twelve, mach machismo and weaponry. Machismo implies both disdain for women and intolerance and condemnation of non-standard sexual habits from chastity to homosexuality. I'm not sure about chastity, but as for homosexuality, as for women's rights. All this is out of question in today's Russia. Homophobia is um, terrible. Uh, domestic violence is everywhere and it is more or less supported by state, by church. Uh, it is uh, looked at as old Russian tradition, husband can beat his wife, father can beat his children and abuse his children. There is nothing bad in it. You should be maybe moderate, do not beat them to death. But the very idea of physical abuse is looked at as Russian tradition. Uh, 13. Selective populism. There is in our future a TV or internet populism in which the emotional response of a selected group of citizens can be presented as ex and accepted as the voice of the people. Well, that is also something that is constantly shown on TV and uh, rally, rallies organized by state where thousands of uh, teachers, uh, medics or other people who get salary from the state are brought to show their support. Uh, young people who cry and shout how they uh, adore and love their president. That is also something that you can, sometimes is false, sometimes people are overwhelmed by this wave of organized enthusiasm and these things, are pre these events are presented as uh, the will of the wish of the whole country. Uh, we have now a very heated debate how many people really support the war. It's clear that many people do, but we're not everybody is sure that they are really so numerous as uh, Russian propaganda presents. And showing all these uh, 
rallies and the groups of elderly women shouting uh, their support for Putin. This is one way of uh, showing how much people love their president. And number 14, fascism speaks you speak. All the Nazi or fascist school books made use of an impoverished vocabulary and an elementary syntax in order to limit the instruments for complex and critical reasoning. It's not so easy to explain this to uh, English-speaking audience, but uh, Newspeak, as understood by George Orwell, is clearly present in Russia. Uh, Russian language is getting more and more impoverished, more and more primitive. Um, maybe a year or two years ago, a very important and well-known Russian linguist and philologist, Gassan Gusainov, wrote an article where he called more than uh, official Russian language, a language that is used in uh, mass media at the moment, a crap language, uh, something that uh, produced a wave of protests and uh, changed the position of this really respected uh, academ academician a lot. As far as I understand, now he left Russia uh, and he teaches somewhere in Europe, I suppose. Uh, but it was, it was clear that all these um, hate speech against this person, all of this um, organized uh, organized uh, protests against his ideas were inspired by state because state recognized the truth of this accusation. So unfortunately I have to admit that all these 14 features, some of them more, some of them less, are, are present in today's Russia. It's a very sad conclusion. The only thing I can say after that that I really hope that it will not be like that all the time. I hope that still in my life I will see some changes. Thank you for your attention. Let's say no to war.